My greatest loves are my steamroller, which I've had running for over 30 years now, and my tracking engine, which I've been working on for about the same amount of time. It's funny, really, that it takes so much time to restore them, when engines like this weren't around for very long. It was only from around the middle of the 19th century until the First World War that things like this were on the roads. By the 1920s, steam was losing out to diesel and petrol engines. And by the 1940s, steam vehicles were heading for the scrapyard in the thousands. Fortunately, some of them were saved by men who like these magnificent machines as much as I do. And in this program, I'm going to be meeting some of them. And looking back to a time when our roads were full of engines like this one of mine. About 30 odd years ago, I bought a steamroller. And I, I think I was ripped off, I paid £175 for it. You could buy a steamroller about that time for about £60. Just beat the scrap man. Anyway, time went by. And this steamroller were an incredible wreck. The back wheels leaned in on each other. And if you went over a manhole cover, the road wheel banged on the edge of the rim of the flywheel. And it made the most unbelievable noise that you could ever imagine. So, painstakingly, I slowly but surely made a new one. When people think about steam vehicles on the road, they think of great big heavy things like this one of mine that weighs around 12 tonnes. But the earliest vehicles to travel on the roads weren't like this at all. This is a replica of a road steam carriage that was built by the Cornish engineer and inventor Richard Trevithick in 1803. And it's quite light and elegant looking really. And the first steam vehicles that were built to run on roads continued like this for some time. By the 1820s, all sorts of people were trying to manufacture steam carriages. Not for their own private use, but for, for to transport the paying public. The thing is that a gentleman called Walter Hancock seemed to do quite well. He, he built quite a few. And this one here is, is a replica of one of his, the Enterprise, which he built in 1833. And of course, Tom Brogdon, who's actually recreated this masterpiece, is here to tell us a bit about it. Isn't that right, Tom? That's right, yes. <laughs> Walter Hancock, in my opinion, Walter Hancock was the best of these early mm. pioneers. He built some magnificent machines, and this was mm. the mid back the middle of the range he built. Mm. Yeah. And um, it's a powerful, fast beast yeah, compared with right. anybody he else. He said he'd do nearly 20 miles an hour. He was doing for the roads what the Stevensons were doing with the railways, yeah. mm. with rocket, for instance. So this mm. is a, contem a contemporary of rocket. I know he had a bit of bother, didn't he? They, they, had, they ended up with an explosion. And... Yes, one of these bo his boilers exploded. But his, his boilers weren't terribly... Uh, so they weren't the best part mm. of it. Mm. They were like uh, seven modern house central heating radiators yeah. bolted mm. it with bolts through. Yeah, with the fire underneath. Yes. And uh, as you can imagine, the, the radiators soon burst, or the other oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, yeah. thin metal burst. Well, even, even one in your house frightens me yeah. sometimes. So that was certainly a weakness of Hancock. I mean, silence really would be very important, wouldn't it, for, to gain sort of the friendship of the authorities because of not frightening horses and things right, like yes. that. He said that he, the, the machines, his machines were so quiet that horses come and looked in the cab to see how yeah. they worked. And, then, and of course the stagecoach men were very jealous That's of him right, and, yes. and tried sabotage, didn't they? Rolling big rocks in his yeah. way. I think that, that actually finished him off, didn't it? He ran out of money as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, But yeah, it certainly yeah. had a lot of antagonism. Hi. Now then, explain all the fun. All the pedals. Well, there we have a steering wheel. Yeah, yeah. There is a thing that looks like a brake here, but it's to release the steering so you can turn the steering wheel. It took three mm. people to uh, mm. operate it. with one person here and one person in the middle, and usually a guy on the back. I'll have a quick sail around the car park. Enjoy your life. All right, mate. <laughs>
Steam carriages like this proved to be an efficient form of transport, but they were badly let down by the state of the roads, and they never really took off in the way that railways did. What we got instead was the tracking engine, and in the second half of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th, great big engines like this were a common sight on the roads and in the countryside. Road locomotives provided the heavy haulage of the day, and steam rollers were developed to build the roads they ran on. In the fields, traction engines were used for ploughing and thrashing, and showman's engines, all fairground rides around the country, and provided the power to operate them. An engine like this could weigh anything up to 20 tonnes. Basically, they were very similar to railway locomotives. This bit, of course, on a locomotive is the main bit, you know, the firebox. This plate here is what's known as the throat plate. It joins the square bit up to the round bit. And this is the boiler barrel, which is the round bit. And inside there, there are 32 two-inch diameter tubes that come from holes in the top of the firebox right through to the front tube plate, which, of course, is hiding underneath here, behind here, where they all poke out and that's just a big void called the smoke box. And of course the products of combustion come from the firebox through the tubes to the front and then are blasted up the chimney by the exhaust pipe. It's turned into the base of the chimney, forming a vacuum inside. The rear end, this is the back axle, and the reason for this moon-shaped hole here, it's not worth that, it's the it's the amount of play that the, the axle has on the springing gear. This nice brass tap here is a very important bit. You get your, your water from when you're making the tea out of it. You know? <laughs> you, it's only for washing your hands, you know, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, depends where you fill it up, of course, you know. I uh, wouldn't recommend really brewing tea out of it. But the earliest ones were nothing like as big as this. And the first ones couldn't even get round under their own steam. When it was realised that some sort of power had got to be introduced into agriculture, the steam locomotive on the railway were already fairly well developed and the, the locomotive boiler, you know, were the obvious thing to pick. And of course they put a wheel on each corner and a pair of oil shafts on the front and called it a portable. And of course it was a very handy machine, you know, it were it sort of you could take it from farm to farm and work the thrashing machine, you could put it up to great saws, you could put it up to rock crushing machinery, you could make it work pumps in industrial areas, like pumping building works out. They even made some called semi-portable which were a portable with no wheels. They, they, they get it there on wheels and then take them off. There's a lovely example here built by Mr. Rawby of Lincoln and it's a beautiful piece of tattle. Here at the Olicum Steam Collection, you can see all manner of steam engines, portables and traction engines that were used in agriculture right up to the middle of the last century. Even long after traction engines had been established, there were there was still like a great market for things like this. The semi-portable, you won't believe it really, but it's a portable engine. It's just bolted onto the top of the boiler. Like the richer farmers who had enough money could have a static engine room driving all this tackle. Whereas the, the farmer who were less affluent, he had, had the thrashing man come in with his thrashing box and his uh, traction engine. This one here was built by Robies of Lincoln in 1915. It drives a great thing called a rack saw with a five foot blade on it that of course will saw great trees into planks and wood for making post and rail fences and, and all that type of stuff. The semi-portable was good for jobs like running a sawmill, where the wood could be brought to the engine. But they also needed engines that could get round the farm under their own steam. By far the largest of all traction engines though, were the ones that were built for ploughing, like these two here behind me at Olicum Steam Museum. And of course, 
in the 1940s when they first put the idea of using steam power for ploughing, they had various different systems that weren't a great deal better than horses. But then a man in Leeds called John Fowler came up with the right idea to put the winding drum underneath the boiler and have two engines, one on one end land and one on the other. And, and then he, he put a lot of thought into the plough. And when the thing were going across the field to the other engine, you dug the plough into the ground at the back. When it got to the other end, you, you lifted it up and the other engine pulled it back, which was quite a good, successful way of doing things. If you go to Lincolnshire and you see the fields all lovely and flat and big, uh, I half think that Mr Fowler really were responsible for that, with a bit of God's help, very beautiful and level. locomotive, very similar to an agricultural tracking engine, but it had a few refinements. Uh, number one, it were always a, a few horsepowers more in, in, in power. It had three gears, most of them had three gears. Uh, it had an extra tank under the boiler for extra water so it could get a bit further. And here there's a beautiful example of a Forden road locomotive pulling two of its brothers that haven't been finished off and a, and a thrashing box at the back. Well, the engine itself is a very handsome piece of tattle, you know, and you can see it's got a beautiful finish on it. Uh, and made in some batch by uh, Fordens, who, of course, are still making modern wagons to this very day. Raw locomotives were in use for around 80 years, and there's no finer sight than a collection of engines all steamed up and ready to go. This is the Strumpshaw Steam Museum in Norfolk, and the man who owns it is Mr. James Key. You have to tell me how it all started. Well, you know? well my father, he, I think he was a deprived child and he didn't have a train set. Yeah. This is what originally started the whole thing off, I think. And then when, we used to, when combines first came out, they used to combine the barley, but the wheat used to be stacked and then thrashed, and they used to buy an engine, drum and elevator every year. A different one? A different one, yeah. because they'd buy the complete set for about 100 to 180 yeah. pounds, ready yeah. to work. Yeah. And they'd thrash it, and then at the end they'd scrap them. <laughs> Unbelievable. Then one of the men on the farm said to him, well, why don't we paint one of these up? Because rallies were just sort of starting, and that's what started the whole thing off. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. it sort of blossomed. Yeah. And how, how many engines have you got? Well, I think with traction engines, showman's engines, rollers, etc., and stationary engines, I think we've got approximately 30, but I never oh, yeah. have counted them exactly. Yeah. It's very strange how it's all gone, isn't it? I mean, 30 years ago, I paid 170 quid for my steamroller. <laughs> and, like... No, they're, they're asking like 20,000, aren't they? Well, just for a, a clapped out steamroller. Yeah, you're very lucky yeah. now if you get a steamroller yeah. for 20,000 yeah, yeah, because yeah. I bought that garret there. I had to buy it off my father's, uh, what, I don't know what you call a lady friend or whatever. Oh, yeah, oh, I know, yeah. You know, There's a lot of that goes on yeah, there, and, uh, in the world of steam. I had to pay 35,000 for that yeah, one. Yeah, you know, yeah. And that really hurt. Yeah, that did yeah. hurt. Mind you, it is a road machine, though, isn't it? The, yeah, that's the, the only only seven horse piston valve left. That one, that's yeah, unique. Yeah, that little engine. Yeah. It's like driving a mini. It's a lovely yeah, little thing yeah, to drive. Yeah. And then we go on that one. Certainly, have the little Garrett. The traction engine I ever had a ride on were a Garrett. <laughs> no, that's, yeah. that's the only one you ride on, like it, because it's unique. Yeah, that's the only oh, one yeah, left of yeah. that model. The traction engine made a big difference to farm work. The engineer could drive the traction engine to where it was needed for things like pulling down and hauling big trees and for threshing corn or sawing timber. Trees that had been felled had to be hauled onto flat ground to be loaded onto carts for transport to the sawmills. Less manpower is needed and more work could be done in a day than ever before. And it's only because of the time and money and cheer our graft put in by dedicated enthusiasts like some of the people who brought their engines here today that we can still see them. Aye, it's really nice to see, you know, us here today doing like 
pulling lumps of wood about and look at engines really doing what they were supposed to do. Mm. Oh, no then. I have a friend who's got a Clayton and Joffa one. Is that right, yeah? Yeah, 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 yes. It's, uh, look, what year's this one? 1919. Have you had it long? No, it only last July we got it. Yeah. How are you finding it? <laughs> well, we had to go on other engines before with friends yeah, and stuff, yeah. Yeah, I'm not and, doing, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've been involved yeah. in other clubs. Just do your apprenticeship, so, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah we had yeah. some good teachers. Mm. Yeah, you've got the wife and all the kids with them. You? Yeah, they all take part in yeah. the engine and yeah. uh, all yeah. have their little bit to do with it. Sort of passion we've got between us. So. It really does take a lot of dedication to get them back into their original condition. My traction engine now is all coming together a bit like a Meccano set. I'm very pleased to say, after about 27 years of uh, bit of struggle and a lot of mistakes and what have you, but uh, we're nearly there. And of course, it's pretty self-explanatory, really. The, the round bit underneath is the boiler, and of course, the bit with all the brass on at the end there is the cylinder block. This is the brake, of course, which acts on the inside of the rims of the back wheels, like disc brakes in a way. This is like the equivalent to the gearbox on a car, like sort of thing. That's it. That's in, in bottom gear. It's all such a good fit. This bit is the uh, special traction engine gauge. The company is very nice. They, they sent me the pamphlet with the original pricing, 17 and sixpence, or something like that. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now for the steamrollers. The first one was built by Thomas Aveling in 1867. And basically it was a variation on the traction engine. They got a traction engine and put two conical shaped rollers instead of front wheels on it with a central pivot. But the, the conical shaped rollers had a, a nasty sliding effect. So they developed then a pair of front forks and two rollers for the differential movement on a dead axle through the through the bottom. About 1930s they stopped making steamrollers and of course uh, the steamrollers that they made in 1930s lasted up till 1960s. They were so good, you know, I mean even today when you're going along motorway, you know, and kids are in car and they say, oh look, a steamroller. It's not a steamroller really, it's a diesel roller, but they're all still referred to as the steamroller. A steamroller is a bit harder to handle than a traction engine and they can be quite dangerous things, as I found out to my cost some years ago. I got this job dismantling some beautiful Victorian chimney stacks and the grand plan was to lower the stones down off the roof of the building onto the trailer and then go with the steamroller and bring them back home. I got a phone call from a restaurant which is situated on top of a mountain outside of Bolton. And the man at the other end, he said, I believe you've got these stones with holes in. I said, aye. He said, how much will you sell us a wagon load for? I said, give us 80 quid. And he said, yeah, very good. And then I thought, how are you going to get up the mountain? The weather couldn't have been worse. It were autumn. The leaves were coming down. Things were terrible. And we set off full of apprehension and fear. And we came to the bottom of the first big hill and it went chuff, 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 chuff. Right up the hill, no trouble. It took us about an hour to unload the, the stones off the trailer, turn the engine round at the top of the hill. And we're coming down the hill, and all traction engines and steamrollers have a design fault. There's no brakes. We're about halfway down the mountain, and it's going really fast. You've got to do the Casey Jones job. Put the engine in the reverse. The wheels are going backwards, but we're accelerating down the mountain. The man from the restaurant stood on the trailer at the back. When he realised things weren't going according to plan, he bid us good day and jumped off over the wall into the field. <laughs> you might be laughing now, but 20 years ago, I come down this hill and the road were only half as wide as what it is now, and it were a one-way street being pushed by a, a trailer that weighed three and a half tonnes. And the wheels of the steamroller weren't even going round, you know, it was just like a big sledge. And by the time we reached this spot here, we were doing about 40 miles an hour, which is incredible for a, something like a steamroller or a traction engine. And of course, I'd got to do something because if we attempted to get round the 45 degree bend, we'd never have made it. 
And over there, there's a, about a 15-foot drop into the back of an hospital. And I have visions of dead old ladies and twisted national health bedsteads and maybe an explosion and a lot of steam. But then I saw that pillar and I said, aim for the pillar. And we hit the pillar, but it didn't stop the engine. The engine proceeded to take off up into the sky with the back wheels somewhere on the top of the stump of the pillar. I think it was a lot thicker and a lot wider. And of course, it's definitely been rebuilt because it's not damaged now at all. The thing is that the rear wheels were on top of the pillar and the boiler dug an hole in the road about there, about 18 inches deep. I just wrecked something that it took me 20 years to make go. Anyway, I managed to get it fixed so there weren't too much of a problem. The trouble was, steamrollers weren't really designed for road haulage. If my traction engine had been finished and I'd have had that to do the job, I wouldn't have had any problems. Back here at Olicum, you can see another type of engine in action. As well as providing power in the fields and for agriculture and road haulage, it soon found its way onto the fairground to drive all manner of fairground rides and, of course, generate electricity. One of the interesting things about the showman's engines were all the wonderful embellishments, you know, the stars and the candy floss, but the most important one was the, the sticking on of a dynamo on the front end to generate the electricity, to provide all the music and to drive the roundabouts. This wonderful ride was called a set of golden gallopers. Obviously, the horses and the galloping about. Steam were first introduced into the foreground about the 1870s. But really, it, it were a man called Frederick Savage in King's Lynn, coming from like agricultural beginnings, uh, started to make roundabouts and, and eventually the engines in the middle, you know, the little engine in the middle that propels it all is called the center engine. And of course, the wall roundabout is built round that engine on a, on a little trailer. And they went from strength to strength and made all sorts of weird and wonderful program rides, all powered by steam. When you think most people only had oil lamps in their houses and electricity were a wonderful thing in, it, in itself. And of course these fellas arrived in the village. It was quite something to see all these lights blowing away. I couldn't have a ride round on that one while it was driving the roundabouts. But they had one at Strumpshaw that I was able to have a go on. One of the first rides I ever had on a traction engine were on one of these. I'm going to ask the driver if I can steer it down the road with him. I think he'll let me. Huh? They're all right, Chris. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right, mate. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They made these engines in, in even more and more and more beautiful and bigger and more grander. And the very last that were ever made were made in the 1930s. All the old ex-army wagons, even after the last war in 1945, they, they, there were lots of American heavy haulage wagons that pulled tank transporters. And, and of course, straight away, the program men jumped onto them and, and made really the showman's engine obsolete just disappeared. Oh, you can't really see a lot driving one of these, can you? Yeah. We're back for this. Yeah. Of course, in olden days, everybody got out of the way, didn't they? Well, that's right, yeah. 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 By 1940, the scrapyards were full of derelict showman's engines in very sad, sad condition. You could purchase one for a few hundred quid, and now it's like 330,000 a piece. Incredible, you know, I think some of them program men wish they'd have kept it in corner of a field somewhere. Thank you for the ride, I'll, I'll see you around later on. See you, mate. Really, you can see that when these things were made, although well, there weren't too many motor cars and they were basically king of the road, you know, sort of thing. If anybody saw one coming, they got out of way. And they, like here at Strumshaw, they've got a fine collection that, you know, more and most 
more, most of them will run along the road. And this thing here is, is like the latest thing in modern technology in steam wagons. It's a, a Ford and six ton over type steam wagon. And I think Pip, the driver, is going to let me have a go in it. So I'm going to climb up and have a look round. Hi, right. hiya Pip, how, how are you doing mate? How are you? <laughs> I'm alright, not so bad. Having an enjoyable day. Very good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Take a seat. So what? I know what the basic bits are, like that's the reversing lever. Yep. For going forwards and backwards. Yep. And this of course is the regulator. That's right. And this is the steering wheel. Yep. And I reckon that must be the brake. That's the handbrake. Yeah. And, and also and we're looking to have yeah, a foot brake foot on this brake one. as well. How many gears has it got? Three. Oh yeah, we've got lots of three gears. Yeah, I think really we'll start off in bottom gear. We, we, yeah, we, we'll try for a bottom one. Yeah. <laughs> what sort of speed does it do on the old road line? Well, we can get up to about 18, 19 miles an hour. Is the, uh, the cut blade very efficient? Is it? Um, not bad, yeah. <laughs> These steam wagons were developed to a very high degree by 1936 or around about then. They were brilliant. They made the diesel wagon and the early petrol wagons puny looking. These steam wagons would do like 40 miles an hour with a trailer full of rolls of cloth, which big rolls of cloth are really heavy, and they used to come down the middle of Manchester Road. Like an express train, everything got out of way, you know, with the safety valves blowing out itself, and the driver hanging out the cab all black, you know, because it's a rather strange way of putting coal on, you know, it's like a dustbin, the boy, inside the cab, with the lid on top, and when you let the lid off, you know, all the heat and the muck coming out in your face, and they still beat the watts it off a petrol engine. And then the men who sell the oil got a bit upset about it and they altered the Road Traffic Act so the axle weights became very important and of course the weight of a steam wagon compared with a petrol wagon made it uneconomical to carry on with the steam wagon even though as efficient and, and powerful that it were they, they were slowly but surely abandoned. The traction engine, the foreground engine survived up till about 1949 in some cases about 1950 and then finally all gone, you know, but for the preservationists and the restoration men, you know, I'm afraid they'd have gone forever. People don't realise there's nearly 4,000 steam-driven road vehicles in all of England. It's incredible, really. So there's still plenty of them around today. And there's more from Fred and the age of steam next this morning on BBC Two and the extraordinary changes it made to the shipping industry. 